In March of 1879, a young boy was born in Ulm who was destined to change the face of science as we know it. Not only did he go on to win a Nobel Prize, but he also rewrote the rulebook for physics and laid down one of the pillars of modern science. This boy was, of course, Albert Einstein. Now, you may have heard of Einstein before and his theory of relativity, and in this video I'll be breaking down just how he discovered this groundbreaking area of physics. But first, we must go back to 19th century Munich. It's here where a young Albert Einstein was immersing himself in his studies and all of the joys that mathematics had to give. At the age of just 12, he was already becoming fluent in algebra and geometry, and by the age of 14, he was said to have mastered calculus. This was obviously the sign of a beginning of a career in an analytical and mathematical environment, and this was no doubt helped along by his engineer father. It wasn't just mathematics that Einstein was involved in, but also philosophy and music, and it may be this love of philosophy that helped him to achieve greatness in the years to come. Albert went on to study at the Zurich Polytechnic in order to further his knowledge of mathematics and physics, and, after graduating in 1900, went on to work in Bern at the Patent Office. This is when things started to take off for Einstein, but before we get into that, I need to talk a little about the science going on at that point in history. Light has always been the subject of much debate in physics, and remains that to this day. The idea of the 1800s was that light travels as a transverse wave, which propagates through a luminiferous ether, similar to how waves travel through water. It was James Clerk Maxwell who is credited for creating the famous Maxwell equations that came up with the concept of light travelling through the same ether that electric and magnetic effects occur in. This belief was further backed up after the discovery of electromagnetic waves themselves. Now the ether concept implies that there is an absolute reference frame from which we can make observations, and to some this seems appealing, but to me it seems kind of illogical. The universe is just so complex, there can't be an absolute reference frame to measure it from. As is the scientific method, experiments were run to try and determine the existence of this ether, and the task in hand landed upon two scientists, physicist Albert Michelson and chemist Edward Morley. Michelson and Morley set out to develop a piece of equipment that could accurately detect the ether. How could they do this though, if it's not even a tangible quantity to us? Well, happily, there was an effect which could help to prove the existence of the ether, and it comes from the motion of the Earth. As the Earth is rotating around the Sun, it is moving through space, and hence must be moving through the ether. If we have measurements taken on Earth, the light on Earth must feel some sort of ether wind from the motion of the Earth through space, and hence the ether. It's like riding your bike on a stormy day. When you go into wind, you travel slower. Using this, Michelson and Morley developed a measuring device known as an interferometer, and it's the same sort of device used at LIGO nowadays. The interferometer consists of two arms with light beams being reflected at each end, and these beams then return to interfere with each other and form a pattern, hence the name. The pattern depends on the length of time it takes the light to travel down the arms. And so if one arm is pointing into wind, the other arm will be pointing across the wind, giving a difference in velocities of the light. A cycling a distance into wind and then back will take a different amount of time to cycling the same distance across the wind and back. They could then rotate this table to see how the patterns varied, and they plotted a graph of the predicted results based on an ether wind which they could compare their recorded results to. However, the outcome of this experiment gave perhaps one of the most famous sets of results in history. So, what did they find? Well, the results that they were expecting were nowhere near the results that they got, which gave a null result for this experiment. Even though the Michelson-Morley experiments had failed, and so ended the either wind idea, out of it sprung new and exciting physics to explain the result in a way that nobody had thought of before. George Fitzgerald and Hendrix Lorentz both worked on the idea of length contraction when an object moves at speed through a stationary ether, 
and others such as Lamour and Poincaré worked with Lorentz to complete the Lorentz transformation, which includes the effect of time dilation. These hypotheses state that a stationary ether would not be able to be detected if we were moving through it, but, crucially, they also laid the basis to a paper that a young physicist in Bern was working on at the time. Einstein was very busy throughout the 1900s, and in 1905 he published four different papers. Any one of these papers could have won him a Nobel Prize, and all of them made a dramatic effect to their knowledge of science back then. Einstein gave an explanation of the photoelectric effect, a phenomenon in which electrons are ejected from metal when light is incident on it, which sets up the evidence that light is made up of particles. He also explained Brownian motion, which refers to the random movement of dust in air, and deduced that fluids are made of particles moving in random directions and with random velocities. All of this was groundbreaking science, but the most controversial paper was yet to come. This was the June paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies, and laid out what is now known to us as special relativity. You may have heard of relativity before, and it can be broken down into two main parts, that's special relativity and general relativity. It's his theory of special relativity that Einstein published first, and I'll be exploring how he did this in the next section. Einstein took an approach almost independent of anyone before him, as it seemed that he could derive simple explanations of natural phenomena using just a few fundamental principles. This may be one of the reasons why he was so successful, as a good scientist will always build up a logical argument from well-established evidence. In Einstein's case, he believed in two fundamental principles, the first being the constancy of the speed of light, and the second being that the laws of physics in any reference frame are the same. What do these mean, though? Well, the second states that the laws of physics will be the same, no matter if you are stationary or moving in a reference frame at the speed of light, as long as you are not being accelerated by a force or gravitational field. This means that special relativity can only be applied in certain circumstances, hence the name special, it only refers to special cases. The principle that the speed of light is a constant is, however, a counterintuitive one, and here's why. Take yourself back to the mind of a younger Einstein, where he was pondering a similar problem. If you're sitting on a train travelling at the speed of light, and you look at yourself in the mirror, will you be able to see your reflection or not? If you can, then from an outside observer, the light travelling from your face to the mirror will be appearing to move at twice the speed of light. Similar to if I run with a ball and then throw it, you would say that the relative speed of the ball to the ground is the sum of its speed relative to me, and my speed relative to the ground. But if the light is travelling at twice the speed of light, this breaks the principle that the speed of light is constant. So, now consider that you can't see your reflection in the mirror as you travel at the speed of light. From an outside observer, the light from your face would be travelling at the speed of light, so this principle is satisfied. However, this then violates the principle that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames, as you would expect to see your reflection if you were at rest. The two key principles seem to contradict each other, yet they were the basis of Einstein's argument. Obviously, there had to be a solution, but it was not in the failing of Einstein's principles, rather it was in the failings of Newtonian mechanics. The only way in which light can move away from you while you are travelling at the speed of light, while the light is still measured to be moving at the speed of light relative to an observer, is if our concepts of length and time are altered when we travel at velocities comparable to that of light. Einstein's theory of relativity builds on the work done by Lorentz and many others to explain the result of the Michelson-Morley experiment, and states that bodies moving at high velocities will appear to be contracted in length along their line of motion, as long as they are viewed by a stationary observer. This means that if a metre ruler flies past you close to the speed of light, it will appear unchanged if you view it front on, but if it is rotated so that it points in the direction that it travels, it will appear to be shorter to you as it passes you. If you were to travel alongside the ruler at the speed of light, it would appear to be a normal length as the laws of physics apply to any inertial reference frame, and there is no relative velocity between you and the ruler. 
This concept can seem really weird at first, but it gets even weirder. Another implication of special relativity is that of time dilation, and what this means is that if you were to take a clock and make it travel really fast, what you would find is that from a stationary observer's perspective, that clock would be ticking slightly slower. The really amazing thing about special relativity is that it removes any need for an ether, which was a part of the hypotheses proposed by others before Einstein. It does take concepts that were developed earlier on, and reworks them from the two key postulates, and this is perhaps one of Einstein's greatest attributes, his determination and independence and trust in well-established phenomena. It's fair to say that special relativity was a fairly controversial idea at the time, and it never even won Einstein a Nobel Prize. However, the scientific community did soon get on board with the concept, and began to set about verifying it. Kaufman verified that mass and velocity are dependent on each other, which backs up the relativity principle, and others soon followed this research. However, the problem still remained that special relativity is only a description of special cases, and the next obvious step would be to include gravity in this description. If you want to find out more about that, make sure that you're subscribed so you don't miss out on part 2 where I'll be discussing general relativity and the impact it's had on modern science.